Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's hearing. Today we're going to hear further opening statements, beginning with uh, counsel for uh, some of the bereaved survivors uh, and residents. So uh, I'm going to ask, without further ado, uh, to hear from uh, Mr. Steen on behalf of his clients. Or is it Mr. Williamson going first? Mr. Williamson, please, if I may. Yes, of course. I'm sorry, Mr. Williamson. I got both you and Mr. Steen down on my running order, and uh, his his name happened to come first. So, but I'm very happy that we should hear from you. Yeah, I, I thank you, sir. That's the um, alphabetical discrimination for which those with uh, W surnames always suffer. I'm afraid. <laughs> I'm afraid but, you're um, right. Yes. Like. Uh, good, uh, good. Good morning, sir. Miss Estevan, Mr. Ackbar. In these oral submissions. I will be dealing, broadly speaking, with what went wrong with the production, marketing, testing and certification of the relevant products, and Mr Stein will discuss the broader context. The fundamental issue for Module 2 is how unsafe and dangerous products came to be used by those concerned with the Grenfell Tower refurbishment. The evidence of how dangerous those combustible cladding materials were is irresistible. Indeed, since the fire at Grenfell, we continue to see images of buildings engulfed in flames, such as the November 2019 fire, which overwhelmed the Cube, a hall of residence at Bolton University. Any assertion that such products could ever have been appropriate for use at Grenfell must be scrutinised against the weight of the evidence. This reveals an industry in which Arconic, Solitex and Kingspan were content to push hazardous products into the marketplace and sought to market them dishonestly. These products should have been safe, they should have been tested and certified rigorously, and they should have been marketed, marketed in an honest and transparent fashion. None of that happened. And the testing and certifying bodies, such as the BRE and the BBA, were quite happy to go along with this process. The marketplace was itself a place of astounding ignorance. In particular, many of those involved did not seem to know or care what was meant by terms such as limited combustibility or class zero. The manufacturers were, of course, only too happy to exploit this ignorance for their own commercial gain. At all times, they concentrated on the route to market, not the route to safety. As early as 2004, Arconic were well aware that their Rainerbond PE cassette product had failed a CSTB test. Could I please have up ARC 30000536 at page 7, please? And one sees there the report that at 630 seconds, there was ignition inside the cassette. By 700 seconds, there was large ignition and that the test was stopped after 850 seconds with the results not being usable. It should be noted that this cassette product should be contrasted with the riveted Rainerbond PE product, which did achieve Euro Class B. Thank you. That, I, uh, that's all I need with that document. Uh, two years after that, Kingspan began to market their K15 product. However, their test experience was as disastrous as our comments. A 2008 test reported as follows, and that's KIN 3020713 at page three, please. And one sees the, the report that the phenolic was burning on its own team, uh, own steam, that the BRE had to extinguish the test early because it was endangering setting fire to the laboratory. It, it burnt very ferociously and gave the top cavity barrier a serious hammer, hammering. And there was a slim chance that it may have held, long, held out long enough that, for the crib to start burning down and that this test would have been successful. Thank you for that. Despite this, Kingspan managed to persuade 
the LABC to issue a document signifying its approval of K15 cool therm in March 2008. However, it should be noted that this approval was read carefully, limited in its ambit, stating that when used as part of an overall wall construction in line with the above and reflecting the standards set out below, cool therm K15 can be deemed acceptable as the insulation element of the system, subject to any limits set out or referred to within the certificate. Kingspan were delighted with this certification and decided to stop testing. What mattered was not safe products or thorough certification, but getting ahead of their rivals in the marketplace. And could I please have up KIN 3005382 at page one, That's an internal report by Mr. Heath of Kingspan, where he notes that following the success of achieving the uh, LABC accreditation, accreditation that, um, that K15 could now be installed above 18 metres, that they should cease further tests and that they were now pre putting pressure on what was described as other component suppliers of this method of construction that is to say, uh, their rivals in the field. Thank you for that, I, that can go down now. Those other component suppliers were up to the same tricks and pulling the wool over the eyes of their supposed guardians in the same way. Arconic had approached the BBA in 2007 to obtain a certificate for its Rainerborn product, providing only the riveted system test report at Euro Class B. In failing to disclose the cassette system test report, Arconic set out to mislay, mislead the BBA. This led to the 2008 BBA certificate stating that a, quotes, standard sample of the product, close quotes, achieved Euro Class B and that the product might be regarded as having a Class Zero surface. This classification was based upon the BBA mistakenly equating the Euro norm with the British National Class Zero in circumstances where Arconic submitted no test reports at all to prove that Rainer Bond PE achieved this class. Arconic were well aware uh, that this certificate should never have been issued. Monsieur Verla knew the 2004 test on Rainer Bond PE cassettes was not a rogue result, but reflected the product's fire performance. In an internal email in March 2010, he commented, and could I please have up MET 3064988 at page 125. So one sees there Mr. Vela, Monsieur Vela saying that Larson um, had based themselves on the cassette tests Contrarywise, he said to what might be expected, the above type of test is much less favourable for the composite than for riveted products. And Rainer Bond PE uh, in cassette form doesn't obtain level B either. Having said that, this shortfall in relation to this standard is something that we have to keep as capitals very confidential for exclamation marks. Thank you. Arconic persisted in this deception for the next decade covering the period in which its products were specified for and used at Grenfell. For example, in a 2016 internal email, Mr. Remy emailed Vela, I really feel like I'm dealing with something that's not clear cut. They're coming to do a review and I'm informing them that what they're coming to review has been completely modified without them knowing anything about it. To which Vela responded, we'll talk about the situation before distribution in order to alleviate this bad impression for you, smiley face. Argon Arconic's abuse of the testing and certification regime extended beyond their conduct with the BBA. They manipulated the testing regime to obtain high classifications for their products, prioritizing sales over safety. Moreover, Arconic were well aware that their product was dangerous, their own word, on high-rise buildings. In July 2009, Verla emailed Arconic Management regarding a high-rise fire which had occurred in Bucharest. Flames had spread along the facade made up of ACMPE panels. 
he said, here are some pictures to show you how dangerous PE can be when it comes to architecture. Mr. Scheidecker, then marketing and sales director, commented, it was clear it was ACM in PE. Likewise, in 2016, just 18 months before the Grenfell fire, Vela emailed the French sales team about a news story to say, we were very lucky. The Wallach Tower, where a fire had occurred, is in Rainerbond PE, 10 metres from the fire. Fortunately, the wind didn't change direction, but we really need to stop proposing PE and architecture. We are in the know, and I think it is up to us to be proactive in capitals at last. Selling the product was all that mattered to our comic, and they were more than happy to mislead their customers. Information was only to be supplied in a selective form, and then only to customers who specifically pressed for it. For example, in July 2010, Vela assured a customer that he could rely on the European Certificate for the Rainer Bond PE riveted system, Class B at that time, as applicable to the cassette system also, because the riveted system performed worse than the cassette system in terms of far performance. Vela was clearly lying about the far performance of the Rainer Bond PE cassettes. And in 2013, uh, an internal Arconic email stated that after talk, talking with Claude, that's Vela, we agreed that we must not write anything relating to fire regulations, which has not been validated or issued by the Arconic Technical Department. Why is that? After showing documents that they send to specifiers and customers, Vela advised me not to do the same, since these documents involve too much our responsibility on a, quote, touchy, close quote, subject. So I pass this info to the, the whole French sales dream team, C, so as to avoid potential mistakes. Well, what might those potential mistakes have been? Well, again, Arconic knew internally that something was very wrong, but certainly did not let that knowledge escape from their company. Only a month after this internal email, Ms. French, Arconic's UK sales manager, informed her colleagues, and could I please have up MET three zeros, five, three, one, five, eight, underscore, capital P 10 at page 153. So she told them, just to make you aware, I sent this link to Claude W, that's Vela, last week concerning a BBC report covering a fire in UAE using ACM. Richard Geeter, the Alucabond rep in the UK, is emailing all fabricators explaining that Alucabond is now using a far call only as standard. The attached email from Mr. Geeter dealt in graphic terms with the situation in the UAE and said that the trouble is that the cladding system here in particular, but all over in general, using PE is like a chimney which transports the fire from bottom to top or vice versa within shortest time. We've taken random samples and done a live test in Bangkok in front of architects. They almost fainted. In this, indeed, this panel is a whole cheat and burns fiercely. Thank you. Ms. French, however, was at pains to reassure Arconic's UK customers that there was nothing to worry about telling them soothingly in May 2013, and could I please have up CEP 3049717. She told them, as you may be aware, there have been some reports via BBC concerning a fire on a building in UAE regarding ACM. As a business, we're aware of this report and our technical team are following the details but in the meantime, I wanted to add some thoughts that may help you if you get questions. Regarding the supply of Rainer Bond in the UK, as you know, we supply both P and FR core and can, can control and understand what core is being used in all projects due to the controlled supply route we have. By only supplying Rainer Bond to a very small group of approved fabricators and working very closely with them on all projects, we are able to follow what type of project is being designed, developed, and then offer the right Rainer Bond specification, including the core. At this stage, 
we will continue to offer both P and FR core. Arconic were, however, well aware of the distinction in performance between Rayner Bond P and FR and their suitability or lack of it for high rise buildings. In October 2015, for example, Verla replied to photos shared with him by a colleague of the aftermath of a fire at a building in China with FR panelling. He said FR showed a very good behaviour. In PE, the fire would have spread over the entire height of the tower, while in this case, only the area near the fire is affected. Long live FR, smiley face. Despite this, Ms. French never proposed that FR should be used at Grenfell. In fact, in these negotiations, she appears not to have discussed the core of the product at all, nor did Arconic change its policy of selling Rayner Bond PE for high-rise architectural applications, except in countries where the regulatory regime required it. Arconic therefore exploited weaknesses in national regulations to continue selling products for applications it knew would be dangerous. Thus, the minutes of a meeting in 2011 between Verla and representatives of a company called 3A record, for the moment, even if we know that PE material in cassette has a bad behaviour exposed to fire, we can still work with national regulations which are not as restrictive. In 2013, Celotex decided that they wished to sell their products into this market. They also were well aware of the fire safety problems to which this would give rise above 80 metres and as to the weakness of the testing and certification system. In November 2013, Mr Roper sent an internal email outlining a possible strategy and could I please have up CEL 30 He noted, he asked, do we take the view that our product realistically shouldn't be used behind most cladding panels because in the event of a fire, it would burn? What Kingspan have done extremely well is say very little, but build confidence if challenged by having fire barrier manufacturers showing tests, achieve BBA validation and subsequently gain LABC approval. There's always the chance they do have the piece of paper in the top drawer from somebody that states for use with any system, but I doubt it. Thank you. These companies therefore both competed with each other, but also built upon what others were doing. Where Kingspan led, others followed. Indeed, Solitex emulated Kingspan assiduously when it came to testing and marketing their product. In February 2014, the first BS8414 test was carried out for the Solitex product, as to which Mr. Clark of the BRE comments in his witness statement that the test was terminated early due to excessive flaming and flame spread. As such, the test was terminated on the grounds of safety. In May 2014, Celotex managed to secure a pass on a second BS8414 test, and the way ahead was clear to sell their product into an unsuspecting market. According to the Celotex witness evidence, a six millimeters magnesium oxide board was placed behind the cladding, and this was used in conjunction with a 12 millimeter thick layer of the cladding. In a chilling PowerPoint presentation entitled quotes above 18 metres, close quotes, in May 2014, the results of the BS8414 test and retest of FR5000 were recorded, together what was said to be market research, which had been carried out, showed that nobody understood the test requirements. Architects used asked if it could be used above 18 metres, to which the answer was going to be yes, and the building control had hugely different levels of understanding of the subject. Shortly after this, Celotex issued their data sheet for RS5000, which asserted that with this product, you were specifying an insulation board that, and could I please have up CEL30. Oh. Mr. Williamson, we, I'm sorry to say we've lost your sound. So, um... Can you make an, oh, we've lost you all together now. So I'm going to suggest that we pause there until we can uh, resume on the usual footing.
I'm, uh, Mr. Uh, sir, I'm here. Oh, good. No, well, now, you had just... Um, I, was, I was just about to take you to... Um, see, RS5000. RS5000, exactly yes. right. Yeah. right. We got you back, so would you like to pick it up there? Yes, indeed. I'm, I'm sorry about that, sir. Thank you very much. Um, it, it was said... Uh, so that the, doc, the document is uh, cel three zeros. Double zero four one one, which recorded that this was the first PIR, PIR insulation board to successfully test two eight four one four to meet the criteria set out in BR one three five, and therefore is acceptable for use in buildings above eighteen meters, and was also said to have class zero performance throughout the entire uh, product. Thank you. There was no suggestion in this document of the failed test or of any of the other uncertainties of which Solitex were well aware. Moreover, the assertion of class zero fire performance throughout the entire product was itself misleading, as it was not class zero throughout, since class zero only related to the spread of fire on the surface. More, furthermore, the standard for insulation in a building above 80 meters was higher than class zero. It was limited combustibility. Sellotex were well aware of the confusion within the industry between class zero and limited combustibility and used it to their advantage. This was consistent with the approach which Sellotex took, the, took to the market in general and in their dealings with Harley relating to Grenfell in particular. In January 2015, in response to a query from Mr. Ankertal Jones, Mr. Room of Sellotex advised he had that he had attached the 12 page BS8414 report showing the build up and components used. And he had also attached a data sheet confirming the products having a BS476 test, which gave it a class zero performance in addition to the BS8414 test. However, if the full 32 page BS8414 test report had been supplied, this would have revealed worrying images of extensive charring and fire damage, as well as the extra layer of magnesium oxide that had been employed. employed. Nobody should have been surprised at the extensive flaming, charring and fire damage from these insulation products. Both the Celotex RS5000 and the Kingspan K15 were rigid foam products whose liquid flammable, flammable components were changed into a rigid foam by the use of a blowing agent, which was itself extremely flammable, pentone. At this same time, and while Grenfell was being designed and built, Arconic were likewise cynically aware that their products were highly dangerous. Thus, Verla advised his colleagues in the summer of 2015 that his opinion was that PE is dangerous in capitals on facades and everything should be transferred to FR, fire resistant, as a matter of urgency. The NFP 92 standard should have been discontinued over 10 years ago. This opinion is technical and anti-commercial, it seems. These three companies, Arconic, Celotex and Kingspan, were in fierce competition, but also learned deadly tricks from one another. Their products were dangerous, Tests and testing and certifying bodies were seen as something to be gamed and got round, not engaged with honestly. Once successful results were obtained by fair means or foul, any failed tests or contrary data were ruthlessly suppressed. Then the products were marketed hard and misleadingly. The fact that the industry was ignorant of many of the issues relating to terms such as class zero and limited combustibility was both known and exploited. Arconic, Celotex and Kingspan were the principal wrongdoers, but they operated in a very murky world. Other corporate bodies were also at fault. In particular, Simcoe knew that the rig it was instructed to build for the 2014 BS8414 test differed significantly from the drawings they were therefore providing practical assistance to Celotex in manipulating the test. Siderise knew its client Harley 
had recently carried out the defective installation of fire-stopping products at Wayland House. It then supplied cavity barriers to Harley for use on Grenfell in 2015. Siderize failed to ensure that no similar issues occurred with the installation of its products there. SIG supplied RS5000 and some K15 for Grenfell, even though they seem to have had major doubts internally as to the safety of these products. Indeed, Mr. Stern of SIG observed in an email to Sudatex in April 2015, never has the expression smoke and mirrors been more appropriate. I think I'll adopt a version of caveat emptor and if specifically challenged, use the rock fiber options. If I'm not challenged, it'll be RS5000. Panel Systems Limited supplied glazing and infill panels, which contributed significantly to the tragic events of the Grenfell fire. They failed to pay any attention to the suitability or lack of it of their Class E rated products. I turn now to the responsibilities, not merely to the industry, but also to society at large. They should have been rigorously independent. Their testing needed to be thorough and exacting. The results of their tests should have been open to full public scrutiny, and the testing bodies ought always to have kept themselves suitably distant from those who sought their services. In fact, the BRE, the BBA and others signally failed to discharge these responsibilities adequately. They were far too close to their customers. Testing was inadequate and certification haphazard. It is not as if they were unaware of the risks. Indeed, in May 2013, at a crucial point in the development of the Grenfell design, the BRE circulated a newsletter with the headline, quotes, the latest high profile fire in the UAE has reaffirmed the need for properly approved, installed and maintained cladding systems in high rise buildings. By their failures, the testing and certification bodies contributed significantly to the Grenfell disaster. In January 2008, the BBA issued its certificate 08-4510 for Rainerbond ACM. This provided, in effect, a kite mark for Arconix product, but it was a deeply misleading document. Crucially, the BBA did not consider the fact that the tests were carried out on two types of cores used in the ACM cladding and their differing smoke production when reacting with fire. The BBA also failed to identify whether the fixing system used was riveted or cassette. Moreover, although as the BBA were aware, Rainer Bond ACM panels came in uh, at what was described as an almost unlimited diversity of surfaces and with an extensive selection of colors and gloss levels, the 2008 certificate contained only the following note. These performances may not be achieved by other colors of the product and the designations of a particular color should be confirmed by test or assessment in accordance with approved document B. This note was clearly inadequate to alert potential customers to the fact that for, the for, for versions of the product with other colors, the reassurance apparently offered by the certificate was meaningless. And it was not only Arconic who benefited from the BBA's benevolence. Later that same year, the BBA issued its certificate 08-4582 for Kingspan's cool firm K15, which stated at section seven, behavior in relation to fire, this product is classified as class zero or low risk as defined in the documents supporting the national building regulations. The product may therefore be used in accordance with the provisions of approved document B. This same section seven also stated that the tested system included 60 millimeters thick board, quotes, mechanically fixed to a non-combustible substrate, close quotes. This substrate was in fact a masonry wall. Kingspan had insisted that the certificate refer to non-combustible substrate so that it could make the claim that um, K15 could be used with any non-combustible substrate and not just a masonry wall. 
crucially, the certificate did not state anywhere that the classification was limited to the specific system tested. Kingspan then ruthlessly exploited the BBA certificate in order to obtain an LABC certificate in 2009 from Herefordshire Building Control. This asserted in relation to requirement B4, external fire spread, that quotes, since K15 can be considered a material of limited combustibility, it is suitable for use in all situations shown on diagram 40 of approved document B, including those parts of a building more than 18 metres above the ground. Kingspan were in, internally quite brazen about the methods employed to persuade Mr Jones of HBC. And could I please have up KIN 30020714 at page one. And we see them referring to being very convincing when they need to be, throwing every bit of fire data we could at him, that's Mr. Jones. We probably blocked his server. In the end, I think the LABC convinced themselves <clears throat> that cool therm is the best thing since sliced bread. We didn't even have to get any real ale down him. Real ale or not, the results for Kingspan was spectacular, spectacular and they were suitably jubilant at having a certification which misleadingly conflated class zero with limited compostability. Later in that same email chain, they noted uh, that there was great news. The highlight of this certificate and supporting documentation is the requirement under B4 of approved document B since K15 can be considered a material of limited combustibility, it is suitable in all situations uh, shown on diagram 40 of approved document B, including those parts of a building more than 18 metres above ground. K15 remains the only insulation board that has successfully met the requirements of the BBA um, <clears throat> and LABC system approval. The successes of Kingspan in certification did not occur by accident, and they did not happen without the collusion of the certifying bodies. These bodies were seemingly aware that they were being played by the manufacturers, but appeared powerless to do anything about it. For example, in 2010, Mr. Meredith of Kingspan approached the BRE with the intimation that he had two new insulation products, which he wished to test in BS 8414, he commented, quotes, potentially I would like two official tests. However, it may also be two indicatives. This depends on costs, close quotes. As to which Mr. Baker of the BRE observed internally, if we do indicatives, how would this be reported? Just reading between the lines of Ivor's email, it seems as though he would try to pass off indicatives as being full tests. Or am I just being a cynic? Nor did the certifying bodies shine any light on the widespread confusion in the industry about class zero, often incorrectly referred to as class O. Thus the LABC's David Ewing emailed Roper of Celotex in January 2014 to say, essentially as the board is described as class zero, it can be termed a material of limited combustibility. And so in terms of the uh, relevant parts of document B, it is suitable for use within the wall construction, even at heights over 18 meters. Moreover, the testers and certifiers bent over backwards to help the manufacturers get positive results. Thus in July, 2014, Mr. Howard of the BRE emailed Kingspan in the following terms. We need to work out what we need to test the critical decision will be what is on the front face of the system. Do we go with the assumption that it is the panel system used in the 8414 test? If I have this correct, have you a data sheet with any reaction to FAR info for that panel? The testers and certifiers were also remarkably unconcerned about what the companies 
they were supposed to be regulating were producing and developing. During the second review of its certificate, the BBA requested certification on at least 12 occasions that there had been no changes in the design, specification, context of use, or other details that would invalidate the certificate. No response was provided by Arconic, and the BBA took no action. They should have done so. In failing to disclose information, despite numerous opportunities to do so, Arconic knowingly breached its contractual obligation to notify the BBA immediately of any new or additional information concerning the product or its suitability. The Rainer Bond PE cassette panel was eventually retested under the European standard, achieving Class E in 2011, 2014 and 2015. None of these test results was disclosed to the BBA. Moreover, in January 2014, riveted uh, B, P, riveted Rainer Bond PE was classified Euro Class E and then consistently classified Euro Class C. None of these results were disclosed to the BBA either. Thus, from January 2014, the BBA certificate statement that Rainer Bond PE achieved Euro Class B was untrue for both cassette and riveted products. Why were the uh, certifiers so indulgent and so unconcerned. A desire not to bite, bite the hand that fed them may well have been an important factor, and we think that that will be a matter to be investigated carefully in the evidence. Strikingly, after the Grenfell fire, the BBA at last recognised the significance of the difference between the riveted and cassette are conic systems and their fire performance. They apparently discovered this via an approach from a journalist who had been himself prompted by a whistleblower. However, even in these circumstances, and even given the appalling loss of life which had occurred, the BBA seemed most concerned to protect its own commercial interests. With an internal email in April 2018, almost a year after the fire, recording as follows, whilst the facts are faint, fairly straightforward, the handling has not been. We have a contractual position with all our clients, including our conic, in which information is confidential. It has taken considerable effort to persuade our lawyers that this was a case where the BBA had to speak up. Imagine how the BBC would have responded if the BBA had declined to comment on whether we were told or not. What all this shows is that the inquiry in module two will need to undertake an unsparing investigation into the toxic and incestuous culture and practices of this industry. How did it come about that unsafe products were manufactured, marketed and sold? How did the test testing and certifying bodies allow this to happen? As regards the investigation which is required in module two, the bereaved survivors and residents are grateful that the inquiry has provided an interactive platform for these openings, which we're all now using. However, they have felt somewhat marginalized since the hearings resumed in July as mere <coughs> spectators on YouTube. They trust therefore that the panel will continue to offer these platform facilities once the oral evidence starts so that the BSRs and their lawyers can feel that they are fully integrated into the process of this inquiry. Moreover, despite their protestations to the contrary, the consumers of these products, so supposedly specialists in their, right, in their own right, cannot be exonerated in any way. In any way. Why was there so much ignorance amongst those involved at Grenfell as to, at Grenfell, as to such concepts as class zero slash O and limited combustibility? Why did they not ask searching questions of the likes of Arconic, Solitex and Kingspan? Why did they specify and use 
dangerous materials. It is important to appreciate that the findings of responsibility which the inquiry must make are not on an either or basis. Very many parties are to blame for this disaster, but the mendacity of the manufacturers and the gullibility or worse of the testing and certifying bodies do not in any way exculpate Ryden, Studio E, Harley and others for their part in this tragedy. Finally, I should say something about the stance which the parties under the spotlight in module two are taking. In his opening statement on 27th of January of this year, Mr. Millet QC observed that he had invited the core participants not to indulge in a merry-go-round of buck passing, but that regrettably that invitation had not been accepted, save for RBKC. The same is true once more in the opening submissions presented for this module. Three things uh, stand out from those submissions. The first is that once again, the corporate participants have decided to devote their extensive resources to blaming others for this tragedy. Thus, Arconic assert that it, quotes, was the responsibility of others to decide whether or not to choose their product for a particular project, how to specify and utilize that product in the construction or refurbishment of Grenfell, close quotes. And Celotex unctuously and unnecessarily assure us that it is, quotes, not a building designer, it does not install exterior installation on buildings and did not do so at Grenfell Tower, nor does Celotex manufacture, supply or install cladding systems. Secondly, such as missions as have been made are very limited and highly qualified. For in instance, Kingspan accepting in relation to product marketing only that, quotes, certain statements made in K15 product literature and advice provided to customers were not sufficiently clear or emphatic in explaining the limitations of the BS8414 testing undertaken. Finally, those opening submissions are couched in very general terms and do not engage in the detail of the widespread and persistent wrongdoing in which Arconic, Celotex and Kingspan engaged <coughs> and which the BRE and the BBA failed to deal with adequately or at all. With that, those observations, I now hand over to Mr. Stein QC, who will be delivering the balance of the opening submissions on behalf of Team 2. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Williamson. Uh, <clears throat> I'll now invite uh, Mr. Stein to pick up where you've left off. Yes, Mr. Steen. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Ms. Estefan and uh, um, Mr. Akbar. What has already been said by Mr. Williams and the QC and others has demonstrated that in hearing the evidence within module two, that sir, you and the panel may well come to the conclusion that the manufacturers are conic Kingspan and Celotex are little more than crooks and killers. These companies knew their materials were dangerous to life. They knew their materials would burn with lethal speed, and yet they marketed their products into uh, an uncaring and underregulated building industry, which spread them around residential buildings like a disease. Just as Arconic hid behind false and outdated data. So we hear that some of Arconic's key witnesses are hiding behind the French blocking statute. If Arconic truly has nothing to fear, then that obstacle can be overcome. These Arconic witnesses are vital. And we echo Mr. Millet QC's words last Thursday, when he said, do the right thing. We suggest they should be fearless. They, and they should come forward and tell our clients the truth. 
one of the truths identified by Dame Judith Hackett in her report was identified as a race to the bottom in the building industry. But Dame Judith did not have the evidence that which we now have within this inquiry, which shows how far companies like Celotex were going to spread around their combustible materials. The product training presentation by Celotex's Jonathan Room at, and then uh, if we can please have it on the screen, at the following reference, CEL 401097, page one, please, makes this point clear. As we see here, this document is dated the 30th of April, 2015, and describes itself as RS5000 product training. We then please go to page 18 of this document. We'll see how this matter is then being dealt with. This is training that's being delivered to the Southern Regional Meeting within Celotex, located in Maidenhead. What we have here is the way that matters are being described, therefore, internally within the company as the best way to promote their products. I see the market for RS5000 being split into three defined potential customer tiers. Helpfully, in terms of this presentation, there then is a um, color um, description used on the face of the next few pages, which assists us in understanding, and no doubt those that were going to sell these products into the market. The first one, please, at 0019, so over the page, please. Red. Red is no use. In other words, no go for seller text combustible materials, as this is a description of the part of the market where it cannot be sold, 0020. Next page, please. Thank you. 0020 is in yellow. Now, this particular slide demonstrates the part of the market where some of the combustible materials can be sold. And next page, please, 0021. Green. Green for go, go, go. This is where combustible materials can be sold. This is where we can make our money, says Mr. Room. We can target buildings, as you'll see from the middle part, where the 18 meters restriction on combustible materials does not cause an issue. And in the middle of that page, under reason, the third bullet point, and where builders are not aware of 18 meter restriction or where the contractors, or where the contractors have always used combustible materials. Thank you, we can take the document down now, please. But Celotex were not alone. This marketing strategy was little different from that employed by Arconic and Kingspan. So we can ignore the clever and well-worked-out oral submissions made on behalf of the manufacturers. These manufacturers knew that the regulations were poor, and they used that fact. But, in the end, it is the combination of the Module 2 companies and those we have considered in Module 1 which are responsible for creating the perfect storm that stole the lives of 72 people and destroyed the lives of countless others. We must not forget that. The Module 1 evidence shows Ryden and the TMO rigged the tender in Ryden's favour to make dangerous cost savings. This evidence appears unassailable and fraudulent. The police, we suggest, should be examining the documentary evidence and instituting prosecutions in this regard as soon as possible. There is no reason and there is no excuse for any delay. 
Let me pause briefly to note that the Eternal General's undertaking does not provide any restriction on the use of oral evidence within disciplinary proceedings. We suggest that the Royal Institute of British Architects, REBA, should review the architect's testimony from Module 1 to consider whether the documentary and oral evidence which demonstrated a failure of professionalism and supervision can be considered by them and should be considered by them to see what regulatory and disciplinary actions can be taken. I turn now to the system of testing, certification and control. We say that the system was weak and ineffectual. The primary agencies of regulation had been captured by the manufacturers and become little more than outsourced research and development departments for the cladding and insulation industries. The failure of regulation is so stark that, as said by Mr. Hyatt a few days ago, a root and branch investigation is required and changes must be made to these regulatory structures. The change in this area does not come easily. It pays to remember that during the Lacknell house fire, the dead were three adults and three young children. One of the adults spent 40 minutes on the phone with 999 responders who urged her to stay in the flat. At the end of the call, the responder could no longer hear her breathing. Such events were to echo repeatedly in the Grenfell Tower fire. If the Lacanal house fire did nothing to change industry, or to change the way that architects were trained, or to assist the fire services, a point you noted, sir, in your phase one report, then we suggest that this inquiry has the clearest of duty arising from its knowledge of the evidence to make its views known as soon as possible and without any unjustifiable delay. It will be shown within module two, instead of reacting to the Lacanal house fire in a positive way by making changes, the manufacturers put themselves into positions where they sought to influence regulation in the worst possible way. Within the system of regulation, the testing and certification bodies were highly regarded. For example, a certificate from the British Board of Agrimont, the BBA, was widely believed to be a gold standard relied upon without question. In the words of the LABC Registered Details Manual, a BBA certificate does provide absolute assurance and materials should not then be interrogated further. The fact is that the public should have been protected from these ruthless and criminal manufacturers by the bodies who are responsible for testing and certification. But the testing and certification bodies provided no such protection. Instead, they reinforced the dangerous and dishonest culture within the industry. Demonstrating how close the testing agency, the BRE, was to industry, Ivor Meredith of Kingspan emails Mr. Philip Clark and Dr. Sarah Colwell at the BRE on the 9th of January 2008. Relatively referenced, please, if we can show it. KIN 4036.93, page one. So you will there see the quote, which is that having cross-referenced with previous tests, it would seem there was more fire spread from the insulate. However, please don't quote me on that. And the cavity barrier may have failed slightly. Your off the record and on the record comments may prove helpful. Is it in any way acceptable for a body that is meant to be protecting people to be working in such a way that Kingspan feels able in open emails to refer to off the record and on the record comments. We can take the quote down, please. Thank you. But it gets worse. On the 17th of October 2014, BRE Stephen Howard emails John Roper and Debbie Berger at Celatex, reference, referencing a conversation they had. And that was regarding 
I, I'll read it rather than going to the quote, regarding the content of the classification reports and the level of technical detail they contained, we need to put a lot of info in, but you don't want your competitors to see it. We have come up with a way of doing it. It seems that Mr. Howard at the BRE was working to support Celotech, to support Celotex as against its competitors. And the evidence shows that the BRE regarded itself as a dependent business. Relatively referenced, please, on screen, BRE 405769, page 105. Page 105, we have the quote that uh, states this. Kingspan are getting very indignant about the delay. We need to report to them immediately if we are not to completely piss them off and lose their custom. Turning now to emails from uh, Jonathan Roper, Roper of Celotex to Phil Clark and others within the BRE. We know that what is said, and please um, uh, put it up on the screen, CEL 3010052, page 12. Thank you. The quote there states, or the relevant quote there states, following the end of the test, Rob, Ian, Cooper, Phil and I had a discussion whilst at the BRE testing centre. Phil said he had seen worse fails and suggested that Celotex might want to strengthen the outside of the test rig to counteract the cracking of the Marley Ethernet panels. That these are not, uh, thank you, we'll take that down from the screen. These are not the actions of an independent and professional testing and certification body. These types of suggestions being made by a BRE employee show that the BRE was working to support the manufacturer's financial goals in October 2013. Mr. Roper from Celotex cynically emailed Stephen Howard, the BRE business group manager, in relation to Kingspan products, reporting which were purporting to be compliant with the BS 8414 test. I don't need to go to these emails. I'll read out the relevant part. What Mr. Howard is being told by Mr. Roper from Celotex is this. We are aware that this product is used in buildings above 18 meters, using a, a wide variety of construction. We are surprised that they feel confident, they being Kingspan, enough to allow their product to be used in buildings their fire test doesn't cover, unless they have a report to say other. So here we have Celotex trying to give information about a competitor, obviously seeking to gain a commercial advantage. Now, instead of BRE's Mr. Howard saying he and the BRE will, um, thank you very much, we'll look into this issue, he said, in, he said instead, and I'll read the quote rather than going to it, if we have issued a test report on a system, then the onus is on the building owner and building control to ensure that the system being installed is covered by a test report. In summary, therefore, Mr. Howard at the BRE was told that products are being misused outside of the test limitation and shrugs off responsibility by saying that the product is not for the BRE, but the problem is not for the BRE, but for the building owner or building control. What does this all add up to? Well, we suggest that the BS8414 test had become a route to market rather than a route to safety. We should remind ourselves of what happens to polyisocyanurate and polyurethane within the cladding and insulation under fire conditions. Professor, Professor Purser's phase one report said this, this is at page 77. The contribution of each of the major products individually is sufficient to produce dense toxic smoke within the flat 
and adjacent lobby within a few minutes. But in practice, the contributions from each burning item are summed as they penetrate into the flat, further increasing the concentrations of Britain's smoke and toxic acid. But what are these toxic acids? Well, they are carbon monoxide, nitrogen dioxide, and hydrogen cyanide, HCM. Hydrogen cyanide, or cyanide is well known and familiar to all. It's a killer, even in small quantities. Mr. <clears throat> Mr. Steen, I'm sorry we've lost the sound uh, from you. Um, and now we've lost you as well, I'm afraid. So we'll pause for a minute while the connection's restored. Sir, I, I, the feed seemed to have gone for a moment. Can you hear me now, sir? We can hear you now, and you had just been making the point that uh, hydrogen cyanide, one of the gases produced when these materials... But Oh, I've lost you again. No. Right, thank you. Well, I think we'll just sit here for a moment patiently while we see if the connection can be restored. So I think that there were some def technical difficulties there that have now kind of been sorted out by the inquiry team. Yes, um, you, you're back with us, and I take it we can hear you. I hope you can hear me. Um, I can say yes. Just to remind you, we lost you at the point where you were <coughs> saying that hydrogen cyanide, one of the gases produced when these materials burn, is a killer. Oh, yes. So, so I'm very great. Right. So you pick it up, I'll pick up from there. From there. By 2015, assessments to BR135 were becoming very popular as a way of demonstrating compliance with the building regulations. And they provided, therefore, a significant source of income for the BRE. On the 20th of April 2015, Tom Lennon, principal consultant at BRE Global, emails Stephen Howard regarding the assessments. And again, I won't put this up on the screen, I'll simply read. 
This will potentially be a huge source of income, but could also be a huge liability if not managed properly. Mr. Howard responds, stating, agreed. I have both testing and assessments flying in from all directions at present. Plus, each test we generate seems to spawn further openings. We suggest that this demonstrates that there is a commercial reality behind the operation of the BRE. That commercial reality should not be present, we suggest, in an independent testing organisation. In June 2012, the BRE prepared a report for Kingspan entitled An Assessment of the External Wall System for the Riverlight Project. This provided an opinion on whether the proposed external wall system complied with approved document B. The proposed external wall system for this project included combustible materials K15. The report highlighted that it expected the panel to fall away from the rig in a BS8414 test. Again, I don't need to go to the document. What it states is the low melting point of this type of framing normally leads to an early deformation and collapse of the system when exposed to fire. However, although BR135 requires that such a performance is recorded, it is not part of the pass-fail performance criteria. On its website, the BRE states that the BRE Trust is an independent charity dedicated to improving the built environment for the benefit of all. It is, though, we suggest questionable whether the BRE was or is, or is improving the building environment for all, or whether it was more simply improving the financial environment for few. The BRE's customers used the BRE as a research and development department. It had, in effect, become part of the marketing strategy for manufacturing companies, provide a veneer of respectability. Instead of doing what it should have been doing, instead of acting as an impartial and independent guarantor of safety. Turning now to the BBA, the British Board of Agriment. The BBA website states that BBA certification is recognised throughout the construction industry as a symbol of quality and reassurance. It's the vital ingredient in the provision of assurance, quality and integrity to a plethora of stakeholders in the construction industry. We suggest that the BBA as an organisation was beset by fundamental issues. Those issues compromised its ability to discharge its safety critical function. Those issues included a lack of independence arising from a fear of losing business, competing commercial interests and a drive for cost efficiency over accuracy. The BBA, BBA also permitted Arconic an extraordinary degree of control over the entire certification process. Mr. Alban, the Chief Scientific Officer of the BBA, confirms Arconic requested the BBA to consider the riveted and cassette versions as different fixing systems rather than as separate products. And it appears the BBA simply acceded to this so rather than imposing its requirements on Arconic, the BBA allowed Arconic to dictate that riveted and cassette versions of the cladding system should be considered different fixing systems rather than separate products. Now, any form of regulatory control should include updating and checks on currency of testing and certificates. And once a BBA certificate was issued, it was then the BBA's duty to regularly review the subject of the certificate to ensure it remained regulation compliant. Although the BBA states that ongoing validity of an agreement certificate is dependent on ongoing surveillance and certificate reviews being satisfactorily carried out, during a series of reviews over several years, Arconic failed to produce its marketing literature when requested by the BBA. 
Despite this persistent and deliberate failure to comply, BBA failed to exercise its powers to withdraw and suspend certificates in the event of non-compliance. Normal regulatory bodies, certification bodies, have a system of highlighting risk. Risk is normally a product of a variety of different issues that come to the attention of that body. And it means that where risk is identified and where there are repeated failures by organizations which are, have dealings with a regulatory and certification body, then normally it means that action is taken. Here, that wasn't the case. As a result of the inadequate review process in which the problem regarding cassettes was never fully investigated and realized, it was determined that the certificate remained valid, even though the only Rainer Bond 55 PE panel that had successfully obtained class B under EN 13501 was Rainer Bond 55 PE riveted rather than PE generally. And Arconic had no EN 13501 test data demonstrating Class B for Rainer Bond 55 PE cassette. On at least 12 occasions, the BBA requested written confirmation from Arconic that there be no changes in the design, specification, context of use, or other details that would invalidate the certificate. This met with no response from Arconic, and the BBA took no action. On the face of the document, the BBA certificates were mis misleading. The front page of the Rainer Bond certificate claimed Class O for both FR and PE products. But the abuse of the BBA certification process was not limited to Arconic. Major competitor Kingspan also manipulated this process to bring a product to market with a fire performance that did not conform to the information on the BBA certificate. The BBA was meant to provide the highest standard of, certifi of certification. But the BBA, we suggest, was not an independent regulator. The relationship with manufacturers was not conducted at a, at a proper distance. And the BBA relied upon manufacturers who wanted their products certified for income. So the fact is that this inquiry now has the evidence from which it can make its views clear for module one. And as we go through modules two and three later on, you will be shown the appalling state of this industry, which in turn should compel you, sir, the, and the panel to make, your vote, to make your views known sooner rather than later. We have suggested in our written submissions that some points are already clear, some examples. Companies selling potentially dangerous products to the construction industry should be required to have a compliance officer to manage regulatory risk. The testing and certification bodies such as the BRE, BBA, LABC, and the oversight regulator UKAS must be overhauled to make sure their systems and tests are first rate and their operations entirely independent. The BRE and the BBA should be placed under a legal obligation to disclose full details of tests undertaken, including any, fa any failures. But let us turn to the inquiry timetable set out in the letter dated the 4th of September of this year. Within module two, we will be dealing with cladding products, testing certification, product marketing. The Timing for this, or subject, of course, to delays caused by factors outside, approximately 2020 to January 2021. Moving then on to Module 3, dealing with complaints and communications with residents, active and passive fire safety measures, approximately February to May 2021. And after the end of the first three modules, the inquiry will then have closing submissions for all three modules in one go. But instead of stopping to take stock and consider the implications of the first three modules, when matters are fresh and complete, the, in the inquiry intends to just keep going. That means that the inquiry continues straight after module three, after submissions have been made, 
with modules four, aftermath of the fire, module five, firefighting, module six, the oversight of regulation to take place in approximately October to December 2021, module seven, further evidence from expert witnesses, approximately December 2021. Moving then after that to the inquest function, clearly in 2022. So if we generously estimate the inquiry evidence stage is finished in March 2022, we will then, I expect, have written in all submissions with a final report, with a final report, it won't be issued until what at best will be December 2022, but more likely to be in 2023. The date of the fire, we all know, was the 14th of June 2017. Margaret Atwood says, if you're going to speak truth to power, make sure it's the truth. So let me give that a try. We suggest that the truth is that this inquiry must evolve itself in the process of change. This inquiry should not just sit on the sidelines and listen to the evidence over the next two years whilst change goes on all around you. So we know you to be, and you have proven yourself to be, a very ex uh, Mr. He's on a pathway. M Mr. Certainly. Mr. Steen, can I? I'm sorry to interrupt you, but we lost you there yes, for a sir. moment. Um, I don't think we lost a lot, but I don't think we got it on the transcript. That's the point. So could I trouble Very you? Well. Trouble you to go back to the point at which you were saying we shouldn't sit on the sidelines. Yes, sir. Well, <laughs> sir, uh, I, I repeat that, um, perhaps usefully, but so I hope for emphasis. We, we suggest that this inquiry must involve itself in the process of change, not just sit on the sidelines and listen to the evidence over the next two years whilst change goes on all around you. And then went on to say, sir, the ch you, sir, are at the chair of the, of the Grenfell Tower Inquiry, are, are, are well known to be very experienced and expert as a judge. And you proved yourself, though you didn't need to, through phase one, to be capable of providing a report which analyzes evidence and makes clear recommendation. And currently, this inquiry is certainly on a pathway to pursue the directly causative facts. But there are issues, we suggest, with whether the inquiry is considering properly the less obviously causative but contributing issues such as class, race, mobility, and aid. So you identified in the phase one report that as regards the rain screen, the principal reason why the flames spread so rapidly up and down and around the building was the presence of the aluminium composite material, ACM, rain panels with polyethylene cores, which acted as a source of fuel as regards the insulation materials, you said this, the presence of the polyisocyanurate PIR and phenolic, phenolic foam insulation boards behind the ACM panels and perhaps components of the window surrounds contributed to the rate and extent of vertical fire spread. So where have we got to now as regards to change since your first report? The Public Accounts Committee reported on the progress in remediating dangerous cladding on the 16th of September of this year. Three years after the Grenfell Tower disaster, in which 72 people lost their lives, only a third of high-rise buildings with Grenfell-style flammable cladding have had their cladding replaced with a safe alternative. Only a third. Progress has been unacceptably slow a conclusion accepted by the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government, say the Public Accounts Committee. So where has been the voice of the inquiry in promoting change? The Public Accounts Committee continued. Most residents in blocks with dangerous cladding face exorbitant costs of funding interim safety measures such as waking watches while waiting for the cladding to be removed. Leaseholders have been trapped in this situation, unable to sell their flats, which are worth nothing. Many residents have reported worsening mental health as a result of worries about their safety and the life-changing bills they face for remediation works. And again, 
So far, no voice from the inquiry in this. There has been astonishing and inspired work from the cladding campaigners, and they are doing their very best in order to push forward the timetable for change and the removal of dangerous cladding. But how much more could have been done if the inquiry were involved? The 2020, the October 2020 monthly report from the Mayor's Office, update on progress of the Grenfell Tower Inquiry recommendation states. The government is responsible for building regulations, including those that relate to fire safety. Issues relating to the construction, refurbishment and management of Grenfell Tower are being examined in more detail in phase two of the inquiry. But it is vital that the government, housing and building industries do not wait for the inquiry's next report to take action on such an important issue. In the opening to module one, I commented on the need potentially to call evidence from the minister, from the mayor's office, as to what change is taking place in order so this inquiry can be satisfied that change is taking place and appropriately so. Now we have a different turn of events. The government, quite rightly, is not waiting for the inquiry. It goes ahead with change without this inquiry's re recommendations. The Building Safety Bill and the Fire Safety Bill's timetable uh, and, and for that legislation to come into effect is 2021, next year. At present, those bills, the Building Safety Bill and the Fire Safety Bill, are going through the committee stages in the House of Lords. What these bills do is they'll create a system of building regulation for building owners and a new system of building safety managers for each building. Each qualifying building will have a safety certificate, which will require regular updating and checking. The system will ensure that qualifying buildings in future will have an accountable person upon whose shoulders responsibility lies. All of this to be dealt with under the um, health and safety executive system. But also proposed is a construction product safety committee with membership which we are told will be comprised of technical experts and academics. It will advise the Secretary of State for Housing on whether voluntary industry standards for construction products should also become UK regulatory standards. Within this legislation, residents remain sidelined into their own committee within the new regulatory structures and appear not to have been thought capable of assessing the risks posed by construction products. And yet again, there is the concern that the profit-driven and focused industry, which has repeatedly proven itself incapable of being trusted, will no doubt try its best to pervert any system that can be put in place and push forward perhaps the technical experts that may be all too close to industry. But are, the, are these the right changes? Do these bills go far enough? This panel should be making that assessment and making its views known. The terms of reference define the scope of this inquiry's investigations. They were set on the 15th of August of 2017. And in this regard, they include, obviously, the immediate causes of the fire, design and construction of the building, and the refurbishment, the regulation, and arrangements made by local authority for receiving and acting upon information obtained by residents. And, crucially, the terms of reference require this inquiry to report its findings to the Prime Minister as soon as possible and to make recommendations. Do any of us think that 2022 or worst, 2023. Does that sound as soon as possible? Ms. Barwise, Queen's Council, set out in all submissions the need for this inquiry to engage earlier than currently considered in the process of recommendations. We agree. But we suggest that this issue requires deeper analysis. Sir, if you and the panel continue on the current course within the current timetable, the consequences will be that any recommendations you make as regards the proposals set out within the fire safety bill, the building safety bill and the product and product safety will come after they have all been enacted and the new structures put in place.
Already, government is setting up a shadow regulator so that she or he can be in place when statute is enacted. On behalf of the families and survivors, we've often complained that the current system of engaging with the inquiry forced upon us by the pandemic has relegated us to the status of YouTube watchers. And we have said in the past that this process means we are not able to effectively participate in the inquiry process. I agree with Mr. Williamson that this platform and ability to interact with the panel is welcome. The term effectively participate is a term drawn from the case law. But what would be worse, we suggest, is that this inquiry is not effectively participating in the process of change going all around it. The sister fan, Mr. Akbar, you must have come into this inquiry because you saw that this was a chance to make a difference. Apologies, Mr. Akbar. I bet you're thinking you've barely warmed your seat. But if you, Ms. Estefan and Mr. Akbar, don't discuss the process and timetable of this inquiry with the chair, there is a real danger that you will also become bystanders to the inquiry in relation to the process of change. So you will recall what it's like on the other side of the courtroom, where an advocate is trying to change a judicial mind when new facts arise and after a ruling has been made. That is what the final report will do in the end of 2022 at best, more likely 23. Because the change will have occurred without your input. So what are the options? The independent inquiry into child sexual abuse works with a system of investigations that is similar to the Grenfell modular system but different from the Grenfell Tower inquiry in that at the end of the abuse inquiry investigation, it then reports on its findings and makes recommendations as to change. And so far, therefore, the independent inquiry into child sexual abuse has had a number of investigations and a number of reports. The infected blood inquiry chair, Sir Brian Langstaff, writes to government and comments on issues that require attention. In other words, there are ways of making your views clear as the inquiry continues. And, to an extent, this inquiry has done this already, but only in part, by splitting its process into phase one and then reporting and then on to phase two. As I've already said, built into our current program, our combined module one to three submissions at the close of modules one to three. As a panel, you may want to consider that this would provide the best time to invite written and oral submissions on what this evidence means in modules one to three and its effect on the, changing, on the changes taking place within the legislative and regulatory structures. Whether you would call that the end of phase two and create a new phase three, phase three will be a matter for you. If you don't do this and don't participate in the process of change whilst it takes place, the voice of this panel will not be heard as it should. And one of the main reasons to have an inquiry will be lost. Surely the duty of an inquiry is to be effective, to use its knowledge at a time when that knowledge is required in order to affect change. And so you'll remember that the close of the evidence of all of the survivors who um, spoke to you in phase one, all of them said that they wish for this inquiry to support change. There is a danger, there is a real danger that the survivors and family members of the Renfrew Tower fire will be let down by this inquiry if it doesn't participate in the process of change. And let me finish with one last point. If you, the panel, adopt the suggestion we make to report perhaps in the following way, after modules one to three as a whole, at the close of those modules, then this would also encourage the currently stagnated police investigation and the DPP to, to reconsider the current halt policy on the criminal process 
pending the conclusion of this inquiry. Once modules one to three are finished, there is no good reason whatsoever to not go ahead with the criminal investigation and to bring the criminals who killed so many to justice as soon as possible. Sir, if you wish us to work with Team One and prepare short submissions into what should be looked at and reported on at the end, at the end of modules one to three, we will of course get that done. So those are, are my submissions. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Steen. Um, I'm sorry that we had one or two slight hitches during the course of your uh, submissions, but uh, I don't think we lost anything. I think you were always able to go back to where we'd left off, so we've got a full transcript of what you have said to us, and we've obviously welcomed hearing from you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Thanks, we'll take a, a short break at this point and uh, come back to hear our next... Uh, legal representative at, I think, 10 to 12, please. 10 to 12, please.
At this point, I'm going to ask Mr. Taverner, Queen's Counsel, to address us on behalf of Ryden. So, are you there, Mr. Taverner? I am indeed, sir. Thank you. You can obviously hear me, and we can hear and see you. So, when you're ready, please uh, make your opening statement. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Ms. Esther Fan, and Mr. Akbar, and all those attending. The inquiry has Ryden's Module 2 written opening submissions dated the 16th of October 2020, and they can be found at RYD 00094561. Those written submissions have the electronic references for the documents to which I will refer to today. Ryden thanked the inquiry for the opportunity to make oral submissions. The dreadful human consequences of the tragedy continue to remain very much in the consciousness of all those I represent. Ryden's interest in this module arises in this way. The inquiry is explored with those who specified and approved products for use at Grenfell, how they came to be chosen, and the reliance placed on marketing material and certification. There is little doubt that, rightly or wrongly, such material played an important role, not only in their selection for use at Grenfell, but also in many other projects involving other construction professionals. Ryden were at the top of the supply chain at Grenville and has acknowledged that it has a contractual liability for those designers and specialists it engaged, as well as those uh, it employed. Today, Ryden focuses on two products, Rainer Bond Polyethylene 55, which I'll call RBP 55, and Celatex RS 5000. Other CPs consider in their opening submission detailed other products such as K15 and the role and involvement of the testing and certification bodies. This of course is not the right place to consider legal liability of the manufacturers or others, where in the context of the statutory duties, contractual obligations or potential tortious conduct. I'll deal with Arconic and Celatec separately if I may. Turning first to Arconic, Certain themes have been developed by Arconic in the course of this inquiry to the effect that Arconic were mere manufacturers of a product, that it was up to others to make sure that its RB55 PE or any other PE product was lawfully and safely used. As a result of this, and in any event, says Arconic, it did not need to know and indeed knew little or nothing of the relevant regulations which governed or restricted its use. Nor, it says, did it concern itself with whether it's RBPE55 product, whether in riveted or cassette form, was suitable for use on particular types of product, such as the above 18 meter market. Arconic says that it was exclusively for others to decide based on the material it disseminated to the market, including that relating to testing and certification. We submit that Arconic's position is simply not borne out by the facts and is indeed insensible. Putting on one side its legal duties, commercial common sense dictates, first, that any, common, uh, that any company manufacturing a product for distribution and use needs to know it is safe to use and is compliant with relevant regulatory requirements, for no other reason than it is likely to be easier to sell a safe, compliant product than one which is not. And secondly, if an industry, in this case the construction industry, habitually relies on independent certification, endorsing the use of a product, a company such as Arconic will need to establish whether it can legitimately gain such certification to advertise the safe use of its product. It is obvious, false or misleading certification can only lead to unsafe product being used when it should not. Arconic had dedicated personnel responsible for ensuring the safety of their products, understanding and keeping up with national and international regulations as well as individuals charged with overseeing independence, testing and certification of their products. Arconic's internal documents are replete with consideration of and discussion about first, safety of RBPE 55, secondly, its compliance with regulations, and thirdly, its certification in Europe by the CTSB and in this jurisdiction by the BBA. What is shocking about these internal documents is first, as to safety, Arconic concluded well before and repeatedly by the time of the sale of RBPE 55 for use at Grenfell, 
that it was so highly dangerous that it should not be used in what it called architecture, certainly not on residential tower blocks over 18 metres, and most definitely not in its cassette form. Iconic discussed these matters internally right up to the time of the fire in June 2017. Secondly, internal documents establish that Arconica concluded that regulations precluded the use of RBP 55 in many jurisdictions, certainly at any height above 18 metres in residential tower blocks. As to the UK, the continued opacity of the UK regulations was such that uh, Arconic viewed that they could be worked with, to use Arconic's own words, to allow it to market and sell for use in the above 18 metre UK market what it knew to be dangerous PE. Thirdly, as to certification, Arconic proactively relied on the 2008 BBA certificate to promote use of RBP uh, PE55 cassette as being safe and compliant with the UK regulations, not just at Grenfell, on the basis it had been tested and achieved either a Class B Euro rating or a Class Zero BS476 UK classification when it knew that it did not. It apparently saw a gap in the certification to be exploited. It could only have knowingly allowed false information to remain in a certificate in order to mislead construction professionals into specifying a product which, with clear and accurate information, they would not otherwise specify. In our submission, any one of these three factors would be sufficient to condemn our conic. To illustrate the above points, we turn to what happened in four periods. We, we've split it up, uh, uh, perhaps artificially, into four periods. The inquiry will excuse me for referencing certain parts of that uh, chronology already referred to the inquiry, but they are important documents. The first period is between 2008, when the BBA certificate was issued, and the 18th of November 2012, the date of the Tamwheel fire in Dubai. The second period is from the date of the Tamwheel Dubai fire to the end of May 2013. The third period, 2014 and 2015, when RBPE55 was selected, ordered and installed at Grenville. And the final period from the installation of RB55PE cassettes at Grenville Tower to the fire. Turning to the first period, if I may, from 2008, when BBA certificate was issued and the date of the Tamwheel fire in Dubai, that was the 18th of November 2012. It, of course, starts with the issue of the BBA certificate on the 14th of January 2008. To summarise, as the inquiry is aware, section 6.1 of the certificate stated that RB55 FR and PE when tested for fire, achieved a classification of B in accordance with EN 135011. I'll refer to that as class B. At 6.3 of the certificate, on the same page, it certified the PE panels, whether riveted or cassette, as a result of its class B classification and tests on FR panels, may be regarded as having a class zero surface in relation to approved document B of the building regulations. Both statements were then false with regard to the classification cassette. Notable features of the story thereafter before the Tanwheel fire include the following. The 17th of July 2009, where, as mentioned by Mr. Williamson this morning, Arconic discussed a fire that had taken place in Romania. And Arconic's Mr. Verla, to whom reference has already been made in this inquiry, commented, and I quote, here are some pictures to show you how dangerous PE can be when it comes to architecture. On the 16th of March 2010, Mr. Verla let slip in an email conversation with the Mr. Scheidecker, and I quote, and Rainer Bond PE in cassette form doesn't obtain level B either. Having said that, the shortfall in relation to this standard is something that we have to keep very confidential. To which Mr. Scheidecker responded, and I quote, this shouldn't even have been mentioned. 
Iconic knows that the BBA certificate wrongly passes off RBPE 55 cassette as having achieved class B and in the UK therefore could be treated as having a class zero rating for the purposes of approved document B. It knows that even mentioning what it calls as the shortfall displays in writing Arconic's knowledge of the misrepresentation being perpetrated on the market. It's clear from an email dated the 5th of July 2010 from Arconic's Isabel Moyes that Arconic's personnel are representing that cassettes have a more favourable rating than riveted when Arconic knows the exact opposite is true. Mr Verna knows this and expressly acknowledges that Arconic is not clean. Not clean, it is suggested, can only mean in this context, we, Arconic, are knowingly misrepresenting the suitability of RB cassette to the market. On the 29th of June 2011, Mr Verla recorded PE cassettes as having received the Class F designation, commenting, oops. The consequence of this were obvious, as reported to by Mr Verla on the 30th of June 2011. The F classification meant that B, uh, RB55 cassettes are, and I open quotation marks, not suitable for use on building facades. Rightly, there are no qualifications to this statement to the effect that it might or would be suitable in combination with other particular materials or with particular measures in place. It was not suitable, full stop, and no ifs and no buts. Did Arconic therefore ensure that it was never sold for use on building facades and warn those where it had been? Regrettably not. Instead, as evidenced in an email dated the 5th of July 2011, Arconic's corporate response was this, quotation marks, for the moment, even if we know that PE material in cassette has a bad behaviour exposed to fire, we can still work with national regulations who are not as restrictive. I turn now to the second period, which starts with the Tamwheel Dubai fire, to the end of May 2013. In this period, the 34-storey Tamwheel Tower caught fire in Dubai. It was clad in PE. This occurred on the 18th of November 2012. The press reported on the fire, stating, and I quote, the fire spread down the building. The cladding acted as a fuel. On the 28th of November 2012, Mr Verla, commenting on the fire, identified the PE cladding as good bond, commenting and acknowledging that, quote, all PE composites react in the same way. On the 25th of April 2013, there are internal Arconic emails in which Arconic personnel state this, quotation marks, the tests that we conducted are not really reflective of the riveted system in general. Also, Alcola aligns with the market classification and does not use it anymore, preferring a class E regardless of the system. Isabel Moyles responds, quote, yet we still won't stop proposing the riveted product in PE, question mark. To which Mr. Verda responds, yes, that's the thing. It's a gap in the certification that we continue to make use of. Note that the not reflective comment tallies with Claude Werler's later note of the 24th of June 2016 regarding, regarding inquiries about a project in Finland when in a disturbing exchange, Mr Werler says this. We also had a class B at the time in PE, but by arranging the system to pass. So this report is really not a reference. Arranging is inverted commas. On the 9th of May 2013, Miss French, Arconic's UK representative, reports to Arconic's High Command, including Mr. Verla, that a, uh, a Mr. Richard Gita, a representative in the UK for Al U Cobond, an Arconic competitor, and in the aftermath of the Tamwheel Tower fire, has emailed Alcubond fabricators explaining that Alcubond is now using a fire core only standard. The email chain includes Mr. Geeta's strident attack on the use of ACMP in the Middle East. 
He says the systems in the Middle East are like a chimney, which transports the fire from bottom to top or vice versa in the shortest possible time. He comments that PE burns fiercely. The forwarded email by uh, Miss French had a link to the BBC report, which reported on the use of ACM with a PE core in the UAE and which referred also to several other fires. It informed our conic personnel of what they already knew, quote, when the panel ignites, fire spreads rapidly, racing to the top of the building and sending flames, debris, flaming debris, hurtling to the streets below. Close quotes. This was another opportunity for Arconic to come clean and to withdraw its dangerous PE from the market. It is quite clearly what Arconic ought to have done. Instead, on the 13th of May 2013, Arconic wrote to its fabricator CEP and apparently uh, other customers as well. And this was written to the knowledge of those uh, at Arconic's uh, headquarters, including Mr. Werler and a Mr. Peter Frohick. The email was sent to a Shaw CEP and other Arconic customer, customers. It was referred to this morning by Mr. Williamson. And referring to the BBC reports, Ms. French said, regarding any inquiries made to suppliers, such as CEP, and I pick it up in the third paragraph, if I may, quote, regarding the supply of Rainer Bond in the UK, as you know, we both, we supply both PE and FR core and can control and understand what core is being used in all projects due to the control supply route we have. By only supplying Rainer Bond to a very small group of approved fabricators, and working very closely, closely with them on all projects, we're able to follow what type of project is being designed, developed, and then offer the right Rainer Bond specification, including the core. At this stage, we'll continue to offer both PE and FR core and continue the close working relationship we have with our approved fabricators to make sure that the right technical support, Rainer Bond specification and materials are being used and installed on Rainer Bond projects." Close quotes. So here, Arconic announced its responsibility. Did not, as we know, see that responsibility throughout, uh, through to Grenfell. And now Arconic in their submissions deny its very existence. To make good on this announcement, Arconic would not have put the PE up for consideration at Grenfell Tower, let alone allowed it to be used. So the third period, 2014 and 2015, when Rainer Bond PE was selected order installed at Grenfell. Over this period of time, even the riveted form of RB PE 55 was downgraded by the CTSB from B to C. However, the BBA certificate not only remained unaltered, but was used to sell RB55 PE cassette on Grenville. Arconic continued to receive reports of yet more fires involving PE. Again, referring to certain important events, on the 31st of July, uh, January 2014, CTSB published the certificates, which cancels and replaces previous certificates, and certified Class E for both RBP55 riveted and cassette. Notwithstanding this, and Ms. French's knowledge of the downgrade, the misleading PBA certificate in the same form as it had been issued in 2008 was on the 23rd of April 2014, sent by Arconic to Harley and CEP, and then by Harley to Ryden in support of the use of RB55 at Grenville Town. On the 25th of July 2014, Ms. French was told that the Grenville architects had chosen RBPE55 in cassette format. On the 31st of July 2014, Miss French has sent a picture of the tower which shows it to be well over 18 metres. On the 17th of October 2014, Arconic's Serge Voller reports to Mr. Verla that Miss French had told him that PE is used regardless of the project and that there's no specific legislation. He commented, Debbie pushes hard for the PE prescriptions. Notwithstanding the assurances given in the 13th of May 2013 emails and knowledge of the misleading BBA certificate, 
PE was being peddled by Arconic in the UK market. Later that year, on the 4th of December 2014, out of the blue, two certificates from CTSB, one confirming cassettes at E and the other for rivet at C. Even if the rivet class C was typical and not an arranged classification, it was inappropriate for use in Europe and the BBA certificate remained wrong for both rivet and cassette. Notwithstanding all that Arconic knew, Arconic confirmed a CEP order uh, for a significant amount, 3,000 square metres, of RBPE55 on the 26th of March 2015 for use at Grenfell Tower. From April, May 2015, the panels were being supplied, fabricated, installed at Grenfell. During that time, on the 5th of May 2015, a report was forwarded to Arconic, Mr Verla and others, concerning the Melbourne lacrosse Docklands fire, a post-incident analysis report. Appendix 12 of that report documents seven fires in high-rise buildings clad with aluminium polyethylene composite panels in which fire spread rapidly over each tower, either from bottom to top or top to bottom. On the 29th of June 2015, consistent with his view over many years and reinforced by the many fires taking place all over the world, Mr Verla writes in a way which can only be interpreted as him recording the fact that he's been told not to talk about the mis-selling of PE into the French market and of PE being represented as M1 standard under the French certification system when it was not. He clearly considered that he should put his now often referred to opinion in writing, quotes, PE is dangerous on facades. This opinion is technical and anti-commercial, it seems. In June 2015, an Arconic sales meeting was told that the technical team's Claude Verla was managing Arconic's regulatory watch and product system certification, and that another individual was managing fire certification. The slideshow produced included a slide which identified with regards to PE quote, limitations given by the smoke production and flame, flaming droplets, close quotes, and under what is said, typical application, quote, maximal building height of eight meters to 12 meters, depending on the country. On the 16th of October, 2015, whilst the refurbishment works continued, Arconic discussed a fire at the King Fahid Medical Center, which used Alcuco Bond FR. It was referred to by Mr. Williamson this morning. Mr. Werler commented, quote, in PE, the fire would have spread over the entire height of the tower, while in this case, the only area near the fire is affected. Long live FR, close quotes. The fourth period is the, uh, and the final section of the chronology, runs from the installation of RB PE 55 cassettes at Grenfell to the date of the fire. This period shows continued cynicism on the part of Arconic and disregard for the serious potential consequences of supplying product that are already been released into the UK market. On the 19th of January 2016, Mr Verla was reporting on another fire, uh, the Wolek Tower fire, uh, as again referred to by Mr Williamson this morning, quote, we were very lucky, the Wolek Tower is REBPE, 10 metres from the fire, fortunately the wind didn't change direction, but we really need to stop proposing PE in architecture. We are in the know, and I think it is up to us to be proactive at last. The specialist manufacturers and with their monitoring of fires worldwide, worldwide Arconic were very much in the know. On the 9th of February 2016, one Hervé Marichais wrote to Mr Werler with regard to what he described as a typical French market case. Quote, do you quote with FR, with your conscience clear, or PR, so you get the business? What a dilemma. That it could even be posed as a dilemma gives an insight into the profoundly irresponsible profit at all costs culture prevalent within Arconic. By the 3rd of May of 2016, it seems that in France, at least the obvious dangers of PE and its uh, uh, lack of compliance with requisite French standards meant that in France, at least, a corporate decision was forced on our colleague. It had to come clean. And it's worth reading this. Uh, and I wonder if I could ask the operator 
to bring up MET triple zero five three one five eight underscore PO six underscore O O nine nine. That's met triple zero five three one five eight underscore P O six underscore O O nine nine. Having set out what he describes as an ambiguous situation... Well, just, just a moment. We haven't got it up yet. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm that's, sorry. That's right. Um, have we got it there? No, I'm sorry. It looks as though we aren't going to be able to bring it up. Would you like to quote from it? I will indeed, sir. Thank you. Thank you. So he sets out in this uh, email what he describes uh, as an ambiguous situation. That's Mr. Alain Falcon. What he describes an ambiguous situation when seeking to align the French NF P92-501 standard to the European EN13501 standard. And I quote, you, and he's referring there to Arconic personnel, or your customers regularly specify our Bond products on large scale architectural projects. As such, Arconic, finds itself as a knowledgeable entity and therefore accepts its responsibility and image as a specialist in this field. In view of the potential calorific benefits of Rainer Bond FR versus Rainer Bond PE, and consequently its superior performance, we have taken the proactive habit of favouring FR as the only solution in our specifications. As from today, I ask you to go even further and to systematically confirm in writing the requirements for FR for all projects on which a Rainer Bond specification is involved, regardless of the nature and size of the building project. Claude, that's Claude Verla, will give you all the necessary information to justify this choice and advise the specifiers as best as possible regarding the solution, which is by far the safest. On the 12th of June 2017, two days before the fire at Grenville, Mr. Werler wrote, with regards to inquiries originating in Israel, quotation marks in Europe, normally PE should no more be used on a building for external cladding, close quotes. Arconic, however, having missold the dangerous PE for use at Grenville, notified no one. Rather ensuring that the right product with the right core was used on the right project, Arconic sought actively to exploit the lack of clarity in regulatory regimes which was slow to respond to the dangers of PE, whether in cassette or riveted form. They issued and relied upon the misleading BBA certificates, which to their knowledge wrongly represented that cassettes had a Euro B classification and relied on an old superseded and arranged tests. They sought to use what they considered were gaps in the certification process. And all this against the backdrop of their explicit knowledge of fire after fire in uh, tower blocks clad in PE, where they understood that all PE acts in the same way, and their explicit recognition that PE was dangerous and should not be used in architecture, in other words, in buildings such as Grenfell Tower. Yet they manufactured and sold RB PE 55, knowing it was to be used at Grenfell. It is suggested that the fire at Grenfell could not have come as any surprise to those in many positions of responsibility within the Arconic uh, organization. Turning now, if I may, to Celotex and the use of their RS5000 insulation board within the cladding system. In 2013, Celotex was looking enviously at Kingspan sales, and in particular, the success of its K15 insulation board in the above 18 metre exterior cladding market in the UK. At a meeting in Durham in June 2013, Celotex considered with a cladding system company, Sotec and fire experts, IFC, how Kingspan could possibly and legitimately seek to support the use of K15 within, within systems using ACMs when the BS8414 tests used by them to obtain the BRE13 fire certification had only tested K15 together with non-combustible cladding. A note prepared by Celotex's John Roper of that Durham meeting stated under the heading K15 BBA certification and literature and I quote, astonished as to how K15 is used so widely based on testing involving a cement particle board as the outer face to represent a typical cladding panel. 
identified the Kingspan used promise seal fire barriers fixed to a galvanized steel sheet. Sotec convinced that the system quoted using a standard cladding panel would fail as the post flashover that occurs would penetrate and melt the panel and allow the flame to enter the cavity. Cleverly designed and worded, i.e. non-combustible substrate wording used in literature could be interpreted as applicable for part one and part two, in parenthesis, CB board and masonry face. Outer face using CP board classified as six mil non-combustible cladding in product literature. There was a further meeting, this time at Peter Lee on the 3rd of October 2013, attended by Sotec and IFC again, and by Jonathan Roper and Jamie Hayes of Celotex to discuss the Kingspan tests and whether what was then called FR5000 could also pass the test. The summary of the meeting states this, quote, fire test, very problematic to pass. Kingspan failed twice with standard cavity barriers. John at Sotex skeptical about pass with decorative cladding. Still no idea how Kingspan support the use of decorative cladding as their fire test uses a non-combustible cladding. Very unlikely to pass on the basis that Celotex FR5000 is slightly better than phenolic, according to IFC testing. Close quotes. During the course of an email exchange later that month on the 31st of October 2013, regarding the possible design of the cladding system to be submitted for BS8414 testing, Mr Roper said this, quote, the big issue we have is that we know that a standard aluminium panel will melt and amount to a failure in this particular test close quotation marks. In an email of the 1st of November 2013 from Roper to Evans, Mr Roper sets out the position at length. It sets out Celotex's view of the lack of knowledge of the industry and consideration of whether to exploit that lack of knowledge. Uh, this can be found at CEL 50716 underscore 0001. And I'll quote from this at length. Quotation marks. Well, I think we have two possible solutions for testing in which both David at IFC and I have confidence in. We'll explain more on Monday, but essentially since the beginning of the project, we've been looking at testing worst case scenario with an improved fire barrier to, then, to be then supported by an assessment report, which broadens the scope of potential systems that we are applicable for. After much research, I don't think this is possible, and I don't believe Kingspan have a similar report. This must be a reference to the assessment report. We cannot seem to find or design a suitable barrier in which we have enough confidence that it can be used behind a standard ACM panel, which we know will melt and allow fire into the cavity. Speaking to Simco on Wednesday in Birmingham with IL, HE confirmed that architects will specify K15 with a standard fire barrier and panel. When the work is contracted and then subcontracted to cladding contractors, such as Simco, HA Mark, Stanmore, etc., they value engineer that system to be competitive for tender. This means changing fire barriers, changing panels. The architect's only guarantee is that K15 will be used because there's no other alternative available. Then the third paragraph of that uh, summary. An architect will be told that K15 is applicable for above 18 metres in accordance with approved documents. And that suffices from their perspective. Kingspan have done a great job at the spec end. And according to Simcoe, has specified much more than Rockwell duo slab for thermal performance. As discussed above, contractors opt for more cost effective solutions. And although they are liable for what goes into that building, they do not know enough about the fire test to challenge. The only figure who might possibly challenge a project's eligibility for use in buildings above 18 metres is the building control officer. Kingspan, I would suggest, do not have a piece of paper that states they can specifically be used behind any cladding panel. What they have done is got BBA certification stating the fire test method and taken that to LABC to get a registered document detail which states that K15 can be used in a variety of cladding systems and complies with approved documents 
through passing BR135. A building control officer is unlikely to challenge a document that is approved from the head of building control. The note then goes on to discuss options and in the fourth and fifth paragraphs before then uh, at the seventh paragraph says this, do we in fact need to spend 25, 30 K for a BBA to be able to gain this document from LABC, which in my mind gives us very little chance of being challenged from building control. Do we partner with a few fire barrier manufacturers who have tested with K15 currently to gain confidence in the market that way? And then this, or do we take the view that our product realistically shouldn't be used behind most cladding panels because in the event of a fire, it would burn? At the eighth paragraph of that email, what Kingspan have done extremely well is said very little but build confidence if challenged by having five fire barrier manufacturers showing tests with K15, achieve BBA validation, and subsequently gain LABC approval. There's always the chance they do have the piece of paper in the top drawer from somebody that states for use with any system, but I doubt it. On the 8th of November 2013, Mr Roper emailed Luke Creswell and John Simmons discussing BRE test week details. In that email, and talking about the BRE test, he says this, quote, as much as they limit the scope of the tested system, they, that's the BRE, do accept that although one system was tested, i.e. Uh, Ethernet, they understand that commonly this allows insulation products to be used with a variety of systems in practice. I think testing with an Ethernet panel is the route to go but shouldn't cause us any issues with, with regards to using Celotex behind Rainer Bond on the up and coming job. I've also got LABC involved to issue a report stating that Celotex can be used behind a variety of systems above 18 meters to prevent any challenge from building control. Close quotation marks. In our submission, five things can be taken from Celotex's document as to the state of play at the end of 2013. First, Celotex were impressed rather than appalled that Kingspan's K15 was taken in the marketplace as being suitable for use with a variety of cladding systems, including AC in cladding above 18 metres. Second, Celotex market research told them that building contractors did not know about, enough about the fire test to challenge. Presumably by challenge, Celotex meant challenge any suggestion, implicit or explicit, as the suitability of the use of the products in a variety of systems, not in fact the subject matter of any BS8414 test. Third, Celotex believed that if an architect was somehow told that K15 was suitable for use above 18 meters in accordance with approved document B, that statement would, or at least could suffice from the architect's perspective. Fourth, Celotex has concluded, or had concluded, that any challenge to a product's eligibility for use in buildings above 18 meters by the building control officer could be deflected with an approval from the body known as the LABC, a body whom could be counted on to issue a report stating that Celotex could be used behind a variety of systems above 18 metres. Fifth, Celotex fatefully turned its back on the accurately expressed view that the product realistically shouldn't be used behind most cladding panels because in the event of a fire, it would burn. I turn now to 2014. With that backdrop, Celotex's first step in 2014 was to get some sort of BRE135 certificate based on BS8414 testing. Having made one failed attempt on the 14th of February 2014 using 8mm Marley Ethernet A2 cladding panels, Celotex tried again on the 2nd of May using thicker 12mm Marley Ethernet cladding and further adding a 6 mil non-combustible magnesium oxide board as reinforcement in the area of the cavity barriers. It passed obtaining BRE135 accreditation. Celotex's knowledge, the BRE test report omitted reference to the 6 mil non-combustible magnesium board. Soon after the BRE passed, Celotex had and held an internal meeting on the 14th of May 2014 a presentation at the meeting was entitled Above 18 Metres. That presentation again was referred to earlier this morning. 
Slide 10 of the presentation contained a review of Kingspan's K15 and how Kingspan had tested K15 using a non-combustible cladding as a facade and obtained LABC approval, commenting that Kingspan had created a strong perception of fire safe cool firm board. It went on and produced slide 11. Again, if it's possible to get up this slide, um, Mr. Operator, I'd be grateful. It's at CEL 408648 underscore double zero eleven. But if we can't, I'll quote from it. Quote. Well, just a minute. Mark, it, it might come up. Just a moment. I'll, I'll see. I think it's. Is that the one you wanted? Oh. No. Uh, no, it's it's not. I'm afraid. It's it's it's. Um, I'll 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 continue and quote from the document if I may. Yes. All right. You carry on. Quote. Under the heading market research, bullet point. Everybody uses K15 as there's no alternative. Bullet point. Nobody understands the test requirements. Architects ask if it can be used above 18 metres. The answer is yes. Bullet point. Building control have hugely differing levels of understanding on the subject. And the final bullet point. Give us a board that is an alternative. This restated the deeply held view in Celatex that nobody understands the test requirements. And Celatex set, set out to exploit that belief. The Celatex marketing team appear to be being told that if they are asked a practical question by an architect, is it suitable for use above 18 metres, you can answer yes, simply and without qualification, presumably by reference to a test of a system, which for all intents and purposes would never be replicated in reality. Celatex then turned their attention on getting the product approved by the LABC, such approval to be used to show building control officers, those whom Celatex assessed as being unlikely to challenge a document that is approved from the head of building control. So on the 17th of June 2014, Celatex emailed LABC with details of the registration Celatex was seeking and the verbatim wording it required and ultimately obtained. On the 21st of August 2014, Celatex was granted LABC registration for RS5000. The register system related to the Celatex RS5000 insulation board for use within rain stream construction with, quote, limitations of use detailed in the attached drawing and document list. That drawing and document list stated as follows, quote, limitations of use. For use in rain screen wall construction, including above 18 metres height, the required thickness of board for a particular construction must be established with the use of Celatex online calculator. This refers to the insulation values. Advice notes. Celatex RS5000 can be used with a variety of cladding systems, including masonry or rain screen systems and can be fixed back to a structural steel frame using a sheathing board or direct back to masonry. Celatex RS5000 has successfully tested to BS84142, meets the criteria set out in BR135, and therefore is acceptable for use in buildings with stories above 18 metres in height, subject to the board being fixed to a non-combustible substrate, alternative compliance to ADB. The product has been tested and achieves a class zero spread of frame. This wording not only gave for all intents and purposes unqualified approval for RS5000 to be used above 18 meters in steel frame cladding systems, such as that tested by Celatex under BS84142, but also extended that unqualified approval to masonry fixed systems falling within BS84141, which Celatex had not even tested. Note also, note also the use of the words non-combustible substrate, which echoed the Kingspan's phraseology 
which it will be recalled that Celotex had regarded as clever at the June 2013 Durham meeting, since it was liable to be misunderstood as applying to the masonry wall. In short, by securing LABC registration in the terms that it did, Celotex now had unrestricted LABC approval for RS5000 to be used in any above 18 metre padding system, which could then be confidently presented to any building control officer. On the 29th of September 2014, Celotex prepared what it called a standard response, which was to be issued to anyone inquiring of Celotex about the use and application of RS5000 and whether it had BBA certification. The standard response should be read in full, but included this, quote, Celotex RS5000 successfully tested to BS84142 and therefore complies with the requirements of ADB for buildings that exceed 18 metres in height. It goes on, Celotex RS5000's current certification from the BRE confirming the product has met the criteria set out in BR13 and therefore is acceptable in rain screen cladding systems above 18 metres in height. The BRE has also validated that Celotex RS5000 achieves class zero fire performance. Celotex RS5000 has also achieved local authority building control, LABC, approval for use in rain screen cladding systems. Please find this attached to confirming that the product is suitable for use in masonry and steel frame constructions and achieve the performance criteria set out in BR135. There's nothing in the standard response that would alert anyone making an inquiry to the reality that in fact, the BR135 certification applied only to Celotex being used in an unusual and atypical combination of products one of which was to Celotex's knowledge undisclosed. On the 6th of August 2014, the very next day after the launch of RS5000, Mr. Room emailed Ben Sharman of Harley as follows. Hi Ben, good to speak to you again. I have the pleasure of informing you as of yesterday we've now launched the first PIR board to successfully meet the performance criteria in BR135 for insulated rain screen cladding systems, therefore acceptable for use in buildings above 18 metres in height. The unqualified email highlighted that Celotex assistance was, assistance was available with regard to the insulation U-value calculations, but not the fact that the BS8414 test were carried out using Celotex as part of an unusual atypical non-standard cladding board system and further undisclosed magnesium oxide board used as a fire barrier. Nor did they point out the statement, therefore acceptable for use in buildings, above 18 metres in height, was for all practical purposes, because of the nature of that test, thoroughly fanciful. Celotex was marketing RS5000 to a contractor whom Celotex had already assessed and hoped as not knowing enough about the fire test to challenge. Room in this email attached the RS5000 product data sheet, the rain screen cladding compliance guide, an application data sheet and a product comparison matrix. The message in the email to Harley was reinforced, reinforced on the first page of the RS5000 product data sheet uh, to which we were referred to this morning. It was under the whole heading suitable for buildings above 18 metres in height. Uh, I won't quote the whole of that document again other to point out <clears throat> that within that first page quote was added has class zero fire performance throughout the entire product in accordance with BS 476 and under a bullet point five, supported by LABC approval. It also said under applications on the same opening page, Celotex RS5000 is specifically designed for use in rainstream cladding systems for both new build and refurbishment products. The application data sheet also sent to Harley was, was on page one almost verbatim to the same uh, in the same terms and sent the same clear message, suitable for use above 18 metres. On the 28th of August, Celotex sent some additional material, uh, uh, a rain stream cladding specification guide, a four page abridged BRE classification, of course, the LABC certificate and drawings and document list. Celotex say now that they were entitled to expect that contractors, architects and building officers would ensure either that one RS5000 was only used in accordance with the internet cement board tested system, and it seems the magnesium oxide fire barrier, 
or two, that the RS5000 should be bespoke BS841 tested with the actual system to be used on any particular project, or three, would be otherwise justified by an assessment report, a desktop study, or some other holistic approach which could extrapolate from the BR135 test. Celotex say now, in effect, that they were entitled to expect that the very people they set out to dupe or that they deemed insufficiently equipped to understand the ramifications of the material it disseminated would not be duped, and so frustrate the very aim of Celotex's marketing strategy with regards to RS5000. Celotex points in its written submissions to what they say was information which made the position clear. For example, on the last pages of the RS5000 application data sheet, and similar wording in the rain screen, uh, rain screen cladding compliance guide, wording such as, and I quote, the fire performance and classification report issued only relates to the components detailed. Any changes to the components listed will need to be considered by the building designer. If that consideration took the form of inquiries of Celotex, they no doubt plan to give the standard response, uh, response and told suitable for use above 18 metres. Celotex point to other similar texts, which concentrate on components as being suitable, not the components being suitable only part of the system. The Rainstream Cladding Compliance Guide, which included wording to the same effect as above, was the only document that reproduced, tucked away, the limitation and warning applicable to BR135 certification, and that it was important to check for the classification documents over the end use application. There are the following points. Celotex knew that the tested system using the thick Marley cement boards, either alone or together with the magnesium oxide board, was not only not standard, but would never be used in practice. Celotex must have known that no properly conducted BS8414 tests with standard panels would ever achieve BRE135 step certification. If that was the case, Celotex could have arranged for those tests themselves. It would have been marketing gold. Celotex must have known that an assessment report or desktop study based on its BS8414 testing could not sensibly verify the use of Celotex RS5000 in the ACM cladding market above 18 metres, and certainly for use with a product similar to RBPE55. Again, Celotex had considered that strategy of getting such a report or assessment, but had abandoned it. Celotex knew that to use RS5000 in a cladding system was unsafe. It knew that it should not be used behind most cladding panels because in the event of fire, it would burn. It follows, we suggest, that Celotex must have known that either the BR135 certification was of no practical value whatsoever in the real market it was seeking to break into, or that the certification, together with how that certification was going to be presented, would likely result in use of RS5000 in circumstances above 18 metres and in cladding systems such as those used in Granville and where it was not suitable for use. The icing on the cake in terms of its marking materials was the nonsensical false and irrelevant assertion that its product complied with class zero throughout this can only have been included in order to give weight to the premise of the certificate. It satisfied BRE 135 and therefore was safe and suitable to use with ACMs in buildings above 18 metres. Celotec's only explanation for its inclusion so far, as it is understood, is that it was useful information without explaining why, or indeed why it wrongly said that it was class zero throughout when it was not. A real mischief in the language of the product literature is that by referring to the RS5000 as the first PIR insulation board to meet the performance criteria of BR135, and that it was therefore suitable, acceptable for use uh, above 18 metres, the impression was given that RS5000 on and of itself satisfied the approved document. That implies compliance via the linear route, i.e. that it was safe to use on its own irrespective of what other components it was combined, combined with to make up a complete canning system. Celotex referenced the BR135 alternative route to compliance for a system, 
but used it to imply compliance via the linear route for a single component of that system. The reference to class zero throughout contributed to the impression that it satisfied the linear route. Neither tranches of literacy are sent to Harley in August 2014 included the health and safety data sheet relied heavily upon by Celotex last Thursday in its opening oral submissions. None of the product literature was sent to Harley that was sent to Harley said that LRS 5000 was combustible. Further, a health and safety data sheet is not where you'd expect to have to look to find details about the fundamental properties of the insulation that affected the range of applications for which it was or was not suitable. The product literature did not direct readers to the health and safety data sheet to find out if it was building regulation compliant, as now suggested by Celotex. After the contract made by Celotex with Harley, there was further correspondence between them throughout the rest of the year. On 17th of November 2014, Grenfell Tower was identified on a list of must-win projects, which was sent to Paul Lake, the managing director of Saint Gobain, UK. During November 2014, as outlined in our written submissions, Celotex was sent information during those exchange, exchanges, which showed that the Celotex was to be used with Rainer Bond 4mm ACM, that it was to be used in cassette format, and that the RS5000 was going to be fixed directly to the existing concrete walls of Grenfell Tower and not to a steel frame. What Celotex hoped would happen on the back of the BRE135 certificate, the LABC approval and its marketing material, in fact happened. Its product was chosen with an ACM, which to its knowledge was RB55 for use at Grenfell Tower Block, over 18 metres in height. What Celotex also knew would happen, happened. The Celotex, in the case of fire, burned with tragic consequences. In conclusion, the aim of both Arconic and Celotex was to have their products used in the circumstances in which they were in fact used at Grenfell, in the knowledge that the understanding of construction professionals was such that it was likely that they would be duped. They were both expressly aware of the potential consequences and as occurred at Grenfell Tower. Chairman, members of the panel, thank you for your patience. Mr. Tubner, <coughs> thank you very much indeed for your submissions. Um, our next speaker is scheduled to appear at two o'clock. So at that point, we will stop for the morning and resume then, that is at two o'clock. Thank you very much.